Hello and welcome to this round four of Mythic Championship 1 here in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Tim Willoughby, joined by Simon Gertson, and we get the honor, nay the privilege, to bring you the start of this standard format here at our Mythic Championship. Now, there's a lot of different things you can do in this standard format, Simon, and you can go all the way from blisteringly fast aggro to some, some pretty fruity control decks that want to go super duper late in the game. Are you surprised to see the breakdown the way the meta games worked out here? Not super surprised. Like the exact numbers were really difficult to predict this time, but I think Mono Blue has shown that it's just a really good deck. Sultai Midrange was the default deck. If you didn't know what to play, you play Sultai Midrange. So not too many surprises. And we're going to get a chance to find out exactly what it is that our pros in our feature match area have picked out here to play in the event as we head down for round four here from Cleveland. Hello and welcome to this Mythic Championship 1 here in Cleveland, Ohio and our feature match area. Bristling with players that have made it through the limited rounds and are now looking to get work done with their 60 card decks. In our feature match area on table number one here, what we're going to be kicking things off with, we've got a world champion, Javier Dominguez. There you see him. He is from uh, Team Hararuya Sword and the Spanish world champion. He is going to be looking to put something together after what must be said was a little bit of a lackluster start for him in draft. Had a little bit of a rough one. He's up against Li Shi Qian, who is uh, also looking to come back after a 1-2 finish in standard. And Li, his, his name on, on Twitter is Li Arson, and he's looking to burn things down a little bit here with a mono red list. Yep, he chose the mono red aggro list. Not a popular choice for the tournament, but definitely a powerful deck, especially with cards like Light Up the Stage and Experimental, Experimental Frenzy, you can go really long. Yeah, Fanatical Firebrand getting in a little bit of damage straight out of the gate. And for having Dominguez on the other side of things, he's on Saltai midrange, so a full three colors to work with. And we'll meet, we may well see that he gets off to a bit of a slower start. It's just going to be a matter of how well he's going to be able to power through to a finish here. Because in principle, his deck with the likes of things like Wild Growth Walker could represent something of a roadblock for these red decks if it can get to that stage. Yeah, if, if anything, the Sultai midrange deck that is still playing Wild Growth Walker Explore package in the main deck is something that you are kind of concerned about if you are mono red in game one. And we have here Runaway Steam Kim coming along for Li Shi Chan, not using the last point of mana there, potentially representing, well, there we see it, a shock on Jade Light Ranger before the Explore can make it any larger. Mm -hmm. in, in this particular case, it would have grown uh, to be a 3-2, but with the trigger on the stack, you don't know if it might become a 4-3, so that was the right timing by Li Shitian to get rid of it, for sure. Also, of course, gets a plus one, plus one counter on that uh, runaway Steamkin, so he's just got more and more damage coming along, and of course, those extra counters on the Steamkin at some point turning extra mana if you, if you want it, just so that you can keep on powering through, which gets kind of interesting once you've got the likes of Experimental Frenzy going. Yeah, even even the shocks in Li Shitian's hand don't look so bad when you put a plus one plus one counter on uh, your Steam Cane for every time you cast a spell. So looking at Dominguez's hand here, he's got a fair amount of lands to work with, but he has got that Wild Growth Walker that we mentioned. The ability to gain life each and every time you explore means that paired up with Jade Light Ranger, if he can get into that stage of the game without taking too much damage, he may be able to get back in things. I mean. The red deck really wants to get in damage early. We just need to see whether or not it's going to be able to achieve that. Absolutely. And uh, Dominguez left a Merfolk branch walker on top of his deck. So if Li Shi Tian taps out, which is, I guess, kind of difficult for him, but he, he could do it, then uh, suddenly that one-two punch of Wild Growth Walker, Forest, branch walker is guaranteed life gain and pump for, for Dominguez. Goblin and Chain are coming down here for Li Shi Qian. I, I guess not too many one toughness creatures that you're really worried about there, so you might as well get that 3 3 body on the board and continue to get damage in. Domingo's now down to just 12 life early doors. This deck, of course, for a long while, functionally was almost just a green-black deck. It was the addition of Hydroid Crisis that suddenly meant that Sultai was a thing. But I like the addition of Hostage Taker as well there, getting rid of that runaway Steamkin before it can, well, run away with the game. Yeah, and Hostage Taker really well positioned right now. You have decks with uh, playing Curious Obsession. You have uh, creatures that become indestructible in, in the mono-white aggro lists. And, of course, Hydroid Crisis is a very juicy card to, to snatch. 
Absolutely, because that way, even if the hostage taker goes away, the Hydro Graces comes back, it's got no counters, it's a much less imposing jellyfish Hydra Beast. Yeah. Li Shichan is a little bit punished here. He didn't draw one of his many wizards, so he has to pay the full price on Wizard's Lightning. When you have the wizard in play, it becomes pretty much the most efficient burn spell you could ever hope to find. As it stands, I mean, Lee has successfully got Dominguez down to eight life here, and this is where Javier has to get things going with that Wild Growth Walker. Gets to explore twice with Jade Light Ranger, so that a great start, but ideally he's going to want to try and uh, keep that walker around for a little bit longer as he reveals Hydroid Crisis off the top of his deck here. Yeah, and this was really a swing turn. Dominguez rewarded for not running out the, the Wild Growth Walker earlier, just saying, I don't need to play this on turn four. Uh, we don't know if he had it on turn two even, but um, it's so much more difficult for the red deck to deal with a four or five toughness creature than with a three toughness creature. I guess that's one of the things when you uh, are choosing to play a red deck, you haven't really got a whole lot to hide in terms of what you're trying to achieve when turn one fanatical firebrand attack you all right, I think we know where this is going, and Javier may be able to alter his game plan right from the very first turn. Lee hasn't found Light Up the Stage or Experimental Frenzy. He, he's just drawing shocks, and now we're reaching this critical stage where the, the creatures on Dominguez's side are just getting too big. On the other hand, uh, Lee almost has Dominguez dead, depending on how, how certain blocks or, uh, uh, yeah, line up. I mean, given that he's got six points of burn in hand and Javier on eight life, he's almost got Javier dead simply with burn to the head here. Exactly, and uh, now he's doing the math. He needs, uh, he needs one of his creatures to connect. So if he attacks with uh, both of these and leaves the firebrand back, he, he can probably guess that Dominguez is going to block both of them. You just, uh, oh, okay, Dominguez is on 14 from the life gain. That wasn't updated. So um, actually, that, that makes it a lot more difficult for the red deck. I mean, I guess still, though, the, um, the Chain Whirler attacking in here, given that it's got first strike, uh, Li Shi Chan can relatively confidently make sure it can survive, even in a fight with that Wild Growth Walker, which is, at the moment, public enemy number one on the other side of the battlefield. The, the Chain Waller is coming in for sure. I think the tough decision is whether the um, whether this team can should get in or not. Because the most obvious block is to put the 4-3 the in front of the team can. That way you're getting a good trade uh, no matter what. Looks like Lee keen to get into the red zone here. Just a block on the on the Steamkin here, so allowing that Goblin Chainwell to get in and do a little bit more damage here. But you can see there the respect from Javier Dominguez. He just really wants to make sure that Wild Growth Walker stays around and he, he's able to leverage the life gain ability on it just a little bit more. Dominguez still has uh, Merfolk Branch Walker in his, in his hand. So for him, if, uh, if, the, if he gets to untap with, uh, with that creature in play, it's just another life buffer that um, Li Shichang cannot get rid of. So we saw two shocks alongside Fanatical Firebrand able to take down the Wild Growth Walker and now Li Shi Chan with the only creature on the battlefield, at least briefly, because here comes our first Hydroid Crisis of our standard format. Coming along with four plus one plus one counters, that means that as it's being cast, two life being gained, two cards being drawn, and now there's a 4-4 flying trampler on the battlefield. This is the kind of thing that the red decks, once these uh, Seltai decks get up to having enough mana, really struggle to deal with. Yep. Now you need something like Experimental Frenzy. Maybe, um, maybe some light up the stages. That would be that would be a good draw for Lee. But if he doesn't find that in the next few draw steps, the game is going to be out of out of reach. Yeah, because even there with Li Shi Qian able to deploy uh, another shock from his hand to make that a favorable uh, fight for him with that uh, the Goblin in play there. He still needs to deal with the fact that Dominguez, on his turn, gained two life, drew a couple of cards, and set himself up for future turns. Cast down here, finally dealing with the uh, Goblin Chain Whirler. And, well, right on time, finally the first wizard in play for uh, Lee here. But if there's another Hydroid Crisis coming from uh, Javier Dominguez, this could be a tough old time for the MPL member on the right of our screen, that being Li Shi Chan. Okay, more Hydroid Crises. This time round, we have 
a 6-6 flying trampler and the red deck 4-4 yes that's something it can reasonably expect to deal with even if it ends up being a little bit mana inefficient once you start talking about 6-6s six or even larger you're, you're talking about using a lot of spells to deal with just one creature on the other side of things and when that creature's gained both life and cards this could be lights out absolutely and something that's also completely backbreaking in these kind of spots is the fact that fine finality is able to just get back uh, the crisis or um, the branch walkers, whatever you want, and there's just no coming back at some point. Yeah, right now the advantage bar very firmly on the side of Javier Dominguez, the world champion, and it's it's not going to take very long once he starts attacking for him to close out this game. At 15 life, he doesn't really need to worry about much that Lee has had going on thus far. Lee uh, prefers uh, those aggressive decks, as we know. And Javier has really become very flexible, uh, especially in standard. He's playing whatever he thinks is the best deck. If it's mono red aggro, he would play mono red aggro, but also Sultai mid range. He's, he's definitely a, a tier one kind of guy. Yeah, and, it, and that's something that can make him quite a scary opponent to sit down opposite, because even though he's a, a very, very affable fellow, he's also someone that you, it's much harder to put him on a deck than various other people in the field. We will, of course, get a chance to see more of these two in our feature match area soon enough. They're just going to sideboarding, and we are going to a short break. Hello and welcome back to this Mythic Championship 1 here from Magic Fest in Cleveland, Ohio. Tim Willoughby here along with Simon Gertsen and we're going to get a chance just while our players in our main match are figuring out the last detail of their sideboarding to see a little bit more magic from one of our other tables. Here we have, well, two different aggro decks. Um, ultimately, they're both attacking life turtles pretty aggressively, but Andrew Ellenbogen, he's not strayed very far from what was able to win him. Uh, the last Mythic Championship, he, when he was just one Pro Tour ago, able to uh, get some games in with his mono white deck, he found himself very favorably uh, with a lot of favorable matchup against uh, Luis Scott Vargas. This time he's got a bit of blue in there. Um, Azorius aggro rather than uh, maybe a little bit of Boros previously. On the other side of things for Ben Stark, well, he is on Rakdos, black-red aggro here. We can see each of these lists kind of leaning very heavily towards uh, one color more than the other. So it's not far off from being mono white against mono red, but there are some pretty important additions for each of these lists based on that little splash. Yeah, Ben Stark's list is actually one 
uh, very similar to one that I've been playing uh, on Arena, which uses the Black Splash to cast um, Carnival Carnage, but also to pay the spectacle cost of Rick's Mighty Reveler, which is quite valuable in a deck that uh, wants to smooth out its draws depending on the on the game state. And here you can see how the mono red deck is able to just go bigger than the than the mono white list. Yeah, I mean, being able to go over the top with those uh, Phoenixes is going to be very, very fiddly for Andrew Ellenbogen to deal with here. I mean, they're just a straightforward, very efficient creature before you even worry about all of the additional abilities that they have in terms of coming back when they've been dealt with the first time around. And here we see, I mean, if you're looking for efficiency on when you're using your cards here, able to get the full impact from the spectacle cost there yeah. on his lowly 2-2 the rest of the time. And that just after Tokadli Honor Guard had uh, chump blocked. So Tokadli Honor Guard already not doing much this game, and then leaving the battlefield just for the Rick's Mighty Raveler to trigger. And that enough for the match there for Ben Stark. His uh, Rakdos aggro deck working very efficiently indeed, and that means that we're going to be able to jump back to our main match here, Javi yeah. Dominguez up against Li Shi Chan. We should maybe note that uh, both Ben Stark and Andrew Elbogen started off 0-3. Wow, yeah, not something that you would typically expect from one of the greatest limited players around in the form of uh, Bill Stark, but also, oh, sorry, Ben Stark rather, uh, but also on the other side of things from Ellen Bogan, I mean, you know, he's so recently been hoisting trophies that, yeah, he's going to have to battle back a little bit from here. And this time around, Heavy Dominguez, he once again has Wild Growth Walker, but Wild Growth Walker on two, that does very much give Li Shi Chan the opportunity to deal with the. 1-3 uh, Elemental, and there a Lava Coil able to do it. And then lighting up the stage in order to be able to potentially cast a few additional things uh, next turn. Because until the end of next turn, those cards exiled by it are available to be cast. And you can see that this is very likely going to be Li Shichian's turn here. Uh, it's going to be another Pyromancer. The Lightning for one is perfect to take out the the Jade Light Ranger, and if you don't cast those spells, uh, you're just going to lose them. So Li Shitian, of course, going for that line. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a funny old thing when it comes to this specific card that, yes, you're giving away a lot of information, but to be perfectly honest, it's worth it because you get so many cards for yeah. such, a, such a low mana investment. You know, if I get to draw two, car uh, two cards for the price of a single red mana, I'm, I'm fine of, with giving away some information. Javier keeping open uh, removal mana here, but it is not really mana efficient what he has been doing uh, thus far. Yeah, for now it's very much been the red deck doing what the red deck wants to, which is whittling down that life total a pace here. Already Dominguez on just nine points of life uh, following that Goblin Chainweller coming along, dealing a single point, and of course the attack from the Ayasheno Pyromancer. Yeah. I've actually found this matchup to not be um, as bad for the mono red deck as you might think, because the answers of Sultai midrange are heavily geared toward beating the mirror matchup, uh, towards beating control. So with almost every answer they, they use, they are losing the tempo uh, battle a little bit. Duress here having a choice between Lightning Strike and Wizard's Lightning. Given that there's a Wizard in play, it seems like taking the slightly more efficient costed spell makes sense, though depending on how long that wizard stays in play, which one's the more efficiently costed spell, not necessarily obvious. Lee opting not to cast Lightning Strike. To, he wants more information about what he draws here. There's always the chance that you um, top deck, for example, a Lava Coil, and then you want to have the flexibility of, of aiming Lightning Strike at your opponent. Of course, there is if you if you have uh, four drops in your deck after sideboarding, there's also this danger of drawing a four drop and being a little bit punished by, by waiting. Dominguez here, just the nine points of life to work with. Li Shi Chan has done exactly what he needs to in these early stages. Unfortunately for him, picking up a mountain here on exactly this turn, meaning that uh, he's only got the one lightning strike in terms of additional damage to force through. And he's not going to be able to put uh, Dominguez here on a one turn clock, has to settle for doing things a little bit more slowly, just attacks with the Goblin Chain Whirler here. As a 3-3 first striker, it's one that's a little bit painful for Dominguez to block here because that 4-3 uh, Merfolk on his side of the battlefield, it will essentially just be chump blocking here. Oh, wow. That would be a, an aggressive block, uh, throwing away a 4-3 that's holding off the Pyromancer just for, just for a few points of life. 
six points of life remaining. And Dominguez knows that there's three points of burn in the other player's hand here that he just needs to hope to fade. Still more burn coming along here as a Merfolk branch walker comes along, lets him explore. Land going into hand. Now Dominguez does have some removal in hand, so he will be able to deal with uh, some of the creatures on Li Shi Chan's side of the battlefield. Though for now, I think the big worry for him is just, is there going to be more burn coming off the top of uh, the other player's deck? Because if that's so, there's really not very much he can do about that. And Lee is playing this beautifully because he doesn't reveal his hand. He could be sitting there with lands, but Javier still has to respect the fact that uh, he needs to keep open uh, removal mana at all times. He can't really take another point of damage. So the life turtles now 5 to 20 in favor of Li Shi Chan. He's got three points of damage on the battlefield, three more points of damage in his hand in the form of a lightning strike that both players know about. And Javier Dominguez here going to have to get something going. He has got Vraska's Contempt, which can both deal with a threat and put him up to seven life, but initially goes for a copy of Find in order to get back two creatures here. And now, now it's whether Javier can gain enough life before Lee draws, draws lethal burn spells off the top of his deck. And of course, this is going to be the Vrasa's Contempt. So Lee has to deal seven points of burn. Seven, a lot more difficult for the red deck to deal than six. Um, we are also hitting a point in the game now where Lee has enough lands in play that if he happens to find himself with an experimental frenzy, he can realistically expect to be able to cast multiple spells in a single turn. Mm -hmm. And Javier is going to dig for Wild Growth Walkers, and uh, Hydroid Crisis. Well, with his copy of Vivian Reed, I believe that he's been given the option of both of those and has elected to go for Wild Growth Walker, bearing in mind that he has cast Find recently in order to get back some creatures that will enable some exploration. Yeah. Javier has, a, has an Explore creature in hand, so it's, this is a guaranteed three life. Either it triggers and you gain three, or it soaks up three, three burn damage. And Li Shi Chan. He's done so well to get the amount of damage in that he has thus far, and he's found an experimental frenzy. This is exactly the kind of card that makes life very, very difficult on the other side of things. You've already got a lot of mana, and you can essentially end up casting, well, spells until you hit a land, essentially. Mm -hmm. It's not great against Vivian Reed, though. Vivian Reed there. Her minus three ability, that the one that threatens an experimental frenzy, and that the reason that Li Shi Chan has held off on casting the big enchantment just for now. So. In some respects, I mean, he's got seven lands in play, so he could cast it for four, and then if he has enough additional land, he could still get something going. But a Duress here from Dominguez appears well-timed. Duress, one of those cards that, it's, it's an interesting one out of the sideboard against these red decks. There's normally something that you can hit, but it's, it's not the kind of the classic matchup that I think that Duress would normally be for against the likes of Control and similar. No, but, but here you can see what it did, it, it prevented a Lee from dealing with Wild Growth Walker before the Explorer resolved. So suddenly Dominguez is saying, well, you are not killing this Walker this turn, and I have Vivian Reed in play already for your Experimental Frenzy, so I'm going to take Lightning Strike with Duress because that guarantees me that I will uh, basically run ahead, run away with the game. And you can see exactly that happening now. You've got a Planeswalker that is fast ticking up towards a potential ultimate while simultaneously threatening an experimental frenzy. You've got a Wild Growth Walker growing ever larger and a Jade Light Ranger that is going to be able to attack in very nicely indeed. This is going to be a tough one for Li Shi Chan to win from here. These players, of course, both started off at one and two with their uh, draft performances. You have to think that when the pairings come up and you're on one and two and you find yourself up against a member of the Magic Pro League, that something strange must be going on. And in this instance, it's looking very likely that the current world champion, Javier Dominguez, is going to be the one that escapes this round, having at least got himself to an even record here. Javier continues his exploration train. Doesn't use uh, the Vivian Reed immediately to get rid of this experimental frenzy. And if you're Lee, this is not the card that you want to see on the top of your opponent's deck. Still more life. But it looks like Javier content to go past it. Hitting his land drops with all that explorer, of course. A trick that has been popular for a while now. 
Vivian Reed deals with the one non-land permanent in play for for Lee and worth noting that Lee has drawn a lot of lands in this second game his is not a list that you would know for having a crazy amount of lands in in fact these mono red decks they're pretty low to the ground they can often be running around about 20 or so lands so having drawn over a third of them is not ideal uh, wild growth walker out of control at this point seven power so this is not going to take very long for Javi Dominguez to close the door on I would not imagine and for Lee here, he knew the top card of his deck already because of Experimental Frenzy. Not too much that he can get going here. He does have a Lava Coil, but he needs fully a Lava Coil into Experimental Frenzy in the hope of finding something. All he finds is a Handshake and Javier Dominguez picking up the win there. Great stuff from Dominguez. Really excited to see uh, how this standard metagame shapes up. It feels to me like the Saltai list very strong. It's one of the ones that we have seen already from our metagame breakdown that we're going to see a fair amount of. And the addition of Hydroid Crisis in there does feel like it really adds an extra element to how that uh, deck plays out. Previously with Green Black, sometimes it felt like they were doing lots of cool things but not closing out games. And the Crisis, it can definitely do that. Mm -hmm. The Crisis is also one of these cards that um, plays around counter magic very well. So suddenly you have that threat and uh, I think especially fine finality becomes so much better in grinding out long games. We're going to get another chance to see how this matchup goes as we have an almost uh, direct replica of what was going on previously. Luis Salvato from Haruya Latin. He's on Celtai mid-range up against Tomoharu Saito who from Haruya Axe is also on Mono Red. So it looks like there's sort of at least in our feature match area for this round, we're getting a good sense of how a particular matchup goes. And an early Hydroid Crisis here from uh, Salvato means that he gets to, hopefully for him, stem the bleeding a little bit. He already picked up game one against Saito. Saito has been playing uh, mono red decks for as long as I can remember. So he, he definitely knows what he's doing. But this is, I mean, you have to be prepared for this matchup. This is the, the tier one deck of the format. This was known before coming into the event. So Hydroid Crisis should not be something that you're surprised about. Yeah, I mean, where things get tricky is the Crisis on its own. I mean, it's, it's been played in a whole variety of decks, and it's just the numbers on it stack up very, very nicely. Where it gets interesting in this deck is that in some respects, the green-black lists of old were all value decks that were good at doing lots of kind of one-for-one one or maybe even a few two-for-ones here and there. The crisis just lets you go way over the top of that. And it's interesting to me to see how it ends up playing out over the course of this weekend, whether or not there is one crisis deck to rule them all, um, and whether or not we're going to see it early doors here in this competition. I think, Tim, there is no doubt that Hydroid Crisis has found its home in the Sultime Rate range lists. You can play let's say two, maybe three, also in Simic Nexus or some, some gate decks, but this is its home. This is where it's at its best. And Saito here, just double checking Vivian Reed, never hurts to make sure that you know exactly all of the options available to your opponent mm -hmm. here. Especially so when it comes to Planeswalkers with a lot of text on them. Let's see what he has going there. A Lava Coil to deal with the Crisis, and that does mean that the path is clear now. I mean, if you're Saito, where are you sending your attacks here? Salvato's at nine, so there's definitely a temptation to just kill him, but... What kind of question is that? Of course. I mean, killing Planeswalkers, though, is, is something that, typically speaking, if you get the opportunity to whittle down Planeswalkers, it often ends up being worth it. Absolutely no. Uh, the, the thing is, you probably aren't winning by attacking Vivian, which, which would still be alive, so uh, Salvato's still benefiting from her abilities, and being on, on that much more life. So I, I agree with the decision. As you can see here, it's just probably not going to be enough. Once again, the combination of Wild Growth Walker plus all of these explores just proving very, very difficult indeed for these red decks. I mean, each time that you explore, it's, it's card advantage anyway. You're, you're either drawing cards or you're uh, making the cards that you're using a little bit better. And then when you're also getting this tempo gain of the life from Wild Growth Walker, plus the Wild Growth Walker itself getting bigger, it, it doesn't feel very fair for these red decks. No, and in the past it was really only Wild Growth Walker. Now it's Wild Growth Walker, but with the threat of Hydroid Crisis, with Fine Finality, with suddenly the Planeswalker activations being that much scarier. Uh, and we almost see a repeat 
of of the game that we just witnessed. Yeah, it feels to me like the occasions where the red decks might end up feeling ahead on here is essentially a combination of getting in a lot of damage early and then hoping to fade some of the key cards that the uh, that the Sultai decks might be hoping to draw in order to stabilize. Once Wild Growth Walker gets to combine up with some Explorers, it just feels like it's a very, very rough match for these red lists. This might be light up the stage coming. Yeah, it, when you see Spectacle get triggered in that way, it, it's, it does send a relatively clear message here. And, you know, two solid cards that obviously the curve on these red decks means that being able to cast them both when you have this number of lands in play, not trivial. Sorry, not, not difficult, rather. Light up the stage, a nice addition to these red lists, but it feels to me like even with it and Skewer the Critics, on balance, it might well be that the other decks in the format may even have gained more. Mm. One thing I find really interesting is uh, how to sideboard with the mono red deck in this matchup, and you can see that Shock is an easy card to take out, but both uh, Saito and Li Shitian opted to keep in most of the early game creatures, so uh, both a Fanatical Firebrand and the Wizard package. I'm uh, actually one that wants to take out more of the cheap creatures because I know that they're going to be dominated early on. So I actually like a sideboarding plan that takes to the skies with Rekindling Phoenix and just plays only three damage burn spells to, to deal with the Wild Growth Walker and ignore the, the other creatures. I mean, as things stand here, double Wild Growth Walker now for Luis Salvato. And with his exploration going on, he's now at up to 25 points of life. All of that hard work from Saito completely reversed by these two elementals that are just getting bigger and bigger here. Salvato with plenty of cards left in hand. He's got a Planeswalker up at eight loyalty now. Removal for days, but he's not going to need days to finish this match because 14 life avail for Saito. He flips a land off the top of his deck. There's the handshake. Luis Salvato picking up the win there. These games are falling thick and fast here in our feature match area, Simon Gerson. It seems like the players even the ones that are playing decks that we wouldn't necessarily classify as being full aggro decks, they can win games with relative mm. alacrity. Uh, actually, a lot of the decks have surprising, surprisingly high closing speed. Only the Esper Control decks and the Nexus decks take a bit longer to win. And even the Nexus decks, it must be said, I feel like they've had a bit of a shot in the arm in terms of the speed at which they can go from establishing nominal control to actually closing out games now that they've got a few additional to tools uh, from this newest set that sort of in general here the time limit especially at these mythic championship rounds uh, you shouldn't be looking that too likely to go to time all that terribly often. and also if somebody minuses a teferi against you, you the writing is, not, is pretty much on the wall but that is the end of what we've got going on here from at least this round. We have plenty more rounds of standards to come both today and indeed tomorrow and on our finals on Sunday. But for now, we're going to head to a short break and then back to Rich at the news desk.
afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the news. That's Rich here at MC Cleveland for you. Uh, we are closing in on the end of round number four. That's the first round of standard. But before we concentrate fully on standard, I want to just go back to one little thing from earlier this morning. Because, of course, the MPL, the Magic Pro League, is getting underway later this year. And 32 players are in that league. So I thought, I wonder how they did in draft as a group. So 32 players, if you think of that as four complete draft pods of eight players, Players, you would expect that at a typical table there'd be one three and oh, three two and ones, three one and twos, and then someone who goes oh and three. That's your standard sort of uh, where the wins go. So with 32 players, that's four tables worth of results. So what you'd expect is four three and o's. If it was just an average, you know, literally a coin flip every round, four three and o's, 12 two and ones, 12 one and twos, and four oh threes. What actually happened, there were eight three and O's from the MPL instead of the four that you might expect. 16 two and ones rather than 12. Six one and twos rather than the 12 one and twos losing record you'd expect. And only two of the MPL went O oh and three in the morning. I know Brad Nelson was one of those, not sure about the other. So, um, you know, what a surprise. MPL better than your average Magic player, even at this level. Uh, eight three and O's, 16 two and one. So three quarters of the NPL with a winning record coming out of draft. And I can tell you that Marcio Carvalho, William Jensen and Reed Duke have gone on to be four and oh. Mark, Brian David Nash Brian, David Marshall, excuse me, put my teeth back in, are down on the floor. So let's see who's with Brian. Oh, well, I'm sorry about that. Um, you can see him, which actually is a lot of the value, let's be fair, uh, but uh, you can't hear him. So hopefully we'll uh, get back down to the floor uh, in just a moment for you. But uh, some more 4 and O. So these are people who are obviously 3 and O'd their draft pod. Um, Andrea Mingucci uh, was 3 and O, and he tweeted, that's the fourth time in a row I've started out 3 and O at this level, which is fantastic. All right, shall we have another go, not just to see him, but to hear him, fingers crossed, his BDM again um, coming up in just a moment. Uh, Sam Pardy 4 and O, Rob Pisano 4 and O. Now he defeated, uh, put the first defeat onto John Finkel, greatest player of all time, Johnny Magic, 3 and O'd his draft pod, 0 1 in standard so far. Autumn Burchett, they're up to 4 and O. We'll hear more from Autumn in a little bit. And Elias Wattsfeld, the former draft master, uh, is up two, four, and O. Oh. But I mentioned that uh, we were going to hear a lot more from Autumn Burchett. Autumn is playing mono blue tempo, and we want to go right the way through standard for you, give you some baselines today, and then some of the really crazy stuff that's doing well as we head through the tournament. So what's going on in the world of mono blue tempo? Here's Maria and Autumn. 